In 2019, I stood to the streets to demand an end to violent policing in America. That didn't happen, but at least I got to keep the gas mask. It's the Uptime. Ask any team lead if they do software testing, and they'll tell you yes. Ask him if they test enough, and the answer's no. When I was writing software full-time, tests kind of drove me nuts. If I worked on a feature for a few days, I often had to work another day on testing. Since stuff like the staging database wasn't available while writing unit tests, I had to create little stubs that simulated the DB response, the data we were expecting from the user on the browser, etc., etc. In the end, sure, my code worked, but I had to do so much lift creating that simulation of a real environment that it's an open question whether these layers of simulacra and simulation were in any meaningful way connected to the real world. As the philosopher Keanu Reeves put it, we start with the divine, create an icon of the divine, copy the icon again and again, and somehow end up with a plastic figurine on the dashboard. So it was a lot of work to simulate, and when we went to deploy software, I was still clicking around and trying to see whether everything really worked the way it should. With time, I came to sort of reject unit testing as a concept. It has its place, but if you're struggling to mock up all the components needed for a test, I think there are better ways to spend your time. I think it's a lot more worthwhile to do end-to-end -end testing, where we deploy every component and then send real requests. Notably, I strongly recommend setting up some end-to-end -end testing on staging, and even on dev, letting someone send an automated request to the development environment to see how all the pieces work together. This brings us to speed scale. Speed scale is easy to set up and can test every single endpoint and route of your API, showing you their status. This is so easy to do that it's something you can trust your developers to handle, meaning they can test environments if they want to. Okay, that's great that we're testing on staging so we don't have to simulate a database response, but uh-oh, staging can't use the Twilio API or other services we rely on. Hey, guess what? SpeedScale can simulate those external dependencies. The last capability is one I really love. SpeedScale can capture and simulate the API traffic you received in the past. So if you know that we had instability at one time and aren't certain why, SpeedScale can replay that incident for your API, letting you know if your code changes have fixed the problem. And hey, guess what? Those cool speed scale reports on how the test worked, they can all be routed straight to your new Relic dashboard. Learn more about speed scale in the show notes below. I mentioned using end-to-end -end testing and observability on your dev environment in a previous segment. And that's actually a pretty big shift for operations practices and new Relic. I read this quote today from Idiel Schwartz, and it really stuck with me. I'll read it in full. The fact remains that tooling is behind the culture. To date, if there's a major incident that needs rapid response, developers often feel powerless because they don't have a connection to SRE tools that are heavily infrastructure oriented. And I think that's true. As we saw in our state of observability survey, more than half of all devs never use an observability tool. Traditionally, observability, security monitoring, network compliance, they were things that happened on or very close to production. I mean, after all, who wants a notification that the dev environment is down at 3 a.m.? When in all likelihood, it was just a case of a CEO who still thinks they know how to write code. That was a joke. If your CEO still thinks they can code, they definitely push their changes straight to production. Okay, so most of these tools only get used in production but we at New Relic think that these tools can be useful earlier in the software development process. The deep distributed traces that New Relic generates, the errors inbox, and the pattern matching of the New Relic dashboard could help every developer. To that end, we're introducing the concept of core users to our licensing. These are meant to cover anyone who's working with code, but probably isn't concerned with how things are running in production. So pushing more to the dev side of DevOps. Core users are inexpensive to add at 49 bucks a month and they get a whole lot. Let me take a deep breath before I say it all. They get the New Relic code stream integration, advanced log management capabilities, New Relic One custom apps, alerts, dashboards, and queries. To start adding core users, you'll need to decipher the clues I've left scattered all over the city, each more devilish than the last. Or look in the show notes. Machine Learning Operations, or MLOPS for short, is a new project from New Relic. Honestly, I think the distinction between machine learning and AI in the general is pretty fuzzy, but here the difference is straightforward. Our anomaly detection system, part of our AI ops system, helps find patterns before you get alerts. Our ML ops tool is about observing machine learning systems. 
If you start creating models with machine learning, you're going to run into a problem even more insurmountable than integer factorization in polynomial time on a classical computer. The problem is cost. Anybody can slice and dice a data set with their laptop with minimal impact. And even spinning up Kubernetes clusters just means spending a few bucks on Google Cloud. But when you're trying to create complex models, runaway cost is a real risk. While it stinks to get a $1,500 AWS bill after someone shares your project on Reddit, it's even worse when large teams don't keep an eye on their systems and end up with bills in the millions. Okay, side note, if you end up with an unexpected bill from AWS, especially if it's way out of line, get in touch with support. They're not trying to surprise you with bills and they've got great tools for cost control. That said, adding observability to the machine learning process is critical and New Relic has new tools to do just that. You can even find and fix data drift, performance degradation, unexpected bias, or data integrity issues. Check out more on New Relic for machine learning monitoring at the link in the show notes. Gas up the DeLorean. It's time to go back to the 80s and talk about syslog. Eric Allman, who'd worked on ARPANET, created SendMail in 1983, a message transfer agent that quickly became the standard way for servers to send and receive email. By the 90s, the majority of email passed through a SendMail system. And as just a footnote on that project, Allman added a way to log messages uh, to report on service status. That system, syslog, is the way network devices still relate status and other information. If you can receive and process syslog data, you can get an extremely low level view of your network health, which as I've talked about before, might turn out to be really critical for finding otherwise invisible performance problems. Receiving syslog data can be quite a trick. Many services won't generate any messages at all for hours or days, then produce millions of messages. The good news is that New Relic now has secure syslog forwarding, using the same Docker image that we use for SNMP forwarding. Even better, if you're worried about FedRAMP compliance, our syslog forwarding is already on our list of compliant endpoints. You can see a full list of New Relic's FedRAMP compliant endpoints in the show notes. Well, folks, that's the uptime. I wanted to thank Jay Goodman for his amazing motion graphics, Doug Brown for edits, Sarah Leslie, our project manager, and Kyle Jones behind the camera, without whom this project would never be possible. See you again soon.